One of the most common issues you'll run into in your game development journey is how to let two unrelated objects communicate with one another in a way that doesn't just completely ruin the organization and flexibility of your code. Maybe we want to increase the player's score when an enemy is killed, or want the UI to show a message when the player gains a level. We don't want to go crawling around the application, connecting unrelated nodes to each other as we please, and creating deep, fragile couplings, such as, say, having our game crash because the player object tried to call a now renamed function in our UI code. But we need a way for these separate objects to talk to one another, and that's what today's video is about. So let's say we've got an action-adventure game, and when the player enters the arena where a boss fight will occur, we want to lock a gate behind them and display a special UI for the boss along with their health. We'd like to implement this using a collision body somewhere in the level that can detect when the player enters the arena and use that detector to trigger these events. The problem is that a specific collision body in a specific level is a long ways away from our UI in the application hierarchy, and while our gate may be closer to our collision object, at best it's parallel to it amongst all other objects in the level or arena, so we still shouldn't access it directly as we want each object in our game to be self-sustaining and independent of the application around it as much as possible. What we really want is a way to shout, hey, the player has entered the arena, and let all the interested parties do whatever they want with that information. Letting them choose how to respond would also let an object choose not to react to an event if it made sense to do so. For example, if the boss is dead, the gate no longer needs to lock itself. The solution is the observer pattern. The observer pattern is such a common design pattern that most programming languages and game engines have native or at least standardized support for it. Therefore, I'm not going to go too into the weeds on how to implement it since you probably won't ever need to do that yourself. With the observer pattern, objects register themselves as wanting to be notified when a certain event has occurred. This registration is usually done by providing what is essentially a callback function. When the event occurs, the subject, which is the thing the observers are observing, will go through the list of all registered objects observer functions and call them one by one. This basic JavaScript example is really just a simple container to hold references to all observers, call their registered functions when the event is emitted, and let them come and go from the list as they please. So if we had a subject for when the player enters the arena, our gate could listen for that event and register the lock gate function to fire when that event occurs. Once the boss has defeated, it can just deregister from the subject and not worry about what the player is doing anymore. If this looks familiar to you, it probably is. For you Godot users, this is called a signal, and if you're using C Sharp, for example, the language has built-in events, and of course, observables are all over the place in the world of web development since there's a lot of asynchronous work going on there. If you're using something else, look up how your language or engine handles events or observables, because the odds are it's already taken care of. So that's the basic theory out of the way, but what would its usage actually look like in a full game? Well, if your subjects and observers are close to each other in the tree, you can get away with connecting them more or less directly by passing around a reference to the subject. So let's go back to our example of locking a gate when the player enters the arena, and let's also assume our level layout and hierarchy consist of an arena object that houses everything that goes inside the arena, including our gate and entrance detector. In this instance, the observer pattern is a great fit as is for notifying the gate of the player entering the arena, and we can set this up by defining a subject on arena entrance detector that fires when it detects the player, having the arena object access and store a reference to this subject during level initialization, and passing this reference to arena gate so it can subscribe to the subject and lock itself when the event is emitted. With this technique, all of our logic is now self-contained. Arena entrance detector can fire off its event anytime, whether or not anyone is listening, and regardless of what the layout of the world around it is, which also has the benefit of letting us turn this into a generic player detector that we can use for triggering cutscenes, tutorials, and more. Arena gate is similarly isolated and reusable since it now just has an event it listens to for locking itself, once again opening itself up to potentially becoming a generic event lockable gate object. And lastly, Arena is there just to facilitate a bit of communication between the two during initialization, but then is absent afterwards, meaning it's doing its higher level job of providing light organization and management help to its immediate children without getting too into the weeds of their implementation. Overall, a lot better than crawling the application tree directly. But what about when the objects we want to connect are far away from each other? For instance, UI elements aren't typically anywhere near the physical objects of our level, so we don't want to crawl up several levels of the application, passing around references at each stop to connect the UI to the arena entrance detector. Our game and level objects have more important things to worry about than connecting lower level objects and events like this. Plus, this would still add some significant coupling and make it a pain if we want to change where or how our UI or detector is implemented later, since we now also have to make adjustments at passing around references for each layer that gets modified along the way. 
What we need in this case is a way to have our subjects be easily accessible from anywhere. And that's where an event bus comes in. An event bus is a globally available object that can let distant objects communicate events with one another without cluttering up the code of the entire application tree each time a connection needs to occur. We do this by making a global object, oftentimes as a singleton, which holds the subjects we want. When an object wants to subscribe to a subject, it can do so by just directly accessing it from the event bus. Similarly, the objects that are responsible for emitting an event can connect to the bus and use those subjects to make their events globally known. So with an event bus, we can just connect our special boss UI to the player entered arena subject the same way we did above, but by using the event bus as the connector. To emit our signal, the arena entrance detector can just call emit on the subject held by the bus. This technique is also a great way to keep UI updated in general. For instance, we could add another subject for boss health to our event bus and let the boss emit an update every time it takes damage. And if singletons and global objects don't bother you too much, you can even organize your code further by using multiple buses geared towards different uses, such as an audio event bus, a UI event bus, and so on. So that's one of the primary options you have for letting objects communicate with one another in a flexible way. The actual implementation may vary a bit between languages and engines, but the concept is pretty much always the same. Additionally, since a lot of viewers here use Godot, including myself, I will take a quick moment to point out that signals, as mentioned above, are the implementation of the observer pattern in Godot, and the way you make an event bus is to simply put your signals in an auto-loaded script and use that to access everything. Godot takes care of all the other implementation work for you. Simple enough, right? Right? And lastly, as is oftentimes the case when there's a good design pattern to talk about, Game Programming Patterns has a much more in-depth look at this pattern in case you want to learn more. 